Today, we become legends. So with the launch of Year 10 Smite, Conquest has received one of, if not the biggest overhaul from season to season that we've ever seen. While the core of how the game mode plays remains roughly the same, the whole map and a ton of intricacies of learning Conquest have changed dramatically. So of course, it's time for yet another edition of the only Conquest guide you'll ever need, this time for Year 10. Quickly before we start, I put a ton of time and effort into making these videos, especially the guides, and I've been making these Conquest guides every season for over 5 years at this point, so if you do find value in these and my other videos, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We're so close to 100k at this point and would love to have you along for the ride as part of the pre-100k club. And while you're down there, why not drop a like on the video? It really helps to show the guide to more people. But without further ado, let's jump in. So this guide will be split up into several different subsections to make it easier to digest and allow you to skip around to the sections you need depending on if you're entirely new, returning after a hiatus or just need a refresher. First up, the basics of Conquest. This will cover the very basics of the mode for completely new players. If you have some experience under your belt already in Conquest, you can probably skip this section. Second, roles in depth, covering all five roles, what they bring to the team and how they play together. Third, jungle layout. The jungle can be a confusing place and this section should help explain the general layout and camp of the jungle. Next up, objectives, the big boys of conquest. Objectives are extremely important for winning the overall match and this section will explain them, what to do, how to take them and defend them, etc. After that there'll be game phases which is a very important section. Conquest matches are generally split into early, mid and late game and this section will explain what to do in each phase and how they transition from one to another. After that we'll have general build rules. This is going to be a new section for the guide that will give you general advice on how to build for each role and what stats are best for each class of gods. And finally we have some misc topics which are just some general topics that didn't really fit into any of the main sections of the guide but they're still very important nonetheless. So with the contents covered, let's jump in with the basics of Conquest. Conquest is Smite's premier and most in-depth mode, taking place on a large three-lane map with five players on each team. Each of these players will fill a selected role that comes with its own strengths and weaknesses, more on those in the next section. Working together as a team, these five roles will aim to acquire golden experience by killing enemy minions and jungle camps to level up and gain access to better items. The overarching goal of Conquest is to take down the enemy towers and phoenixes in each lane to access their titan. Slaying the titan grants you the win, but likewise you will need to defend your own towers, phoenixes and titan to keep the enemy from taking you down. We'll of course go into more detail on exactly what to do throughout the match later on, but that's the basic end goal of Conquest. The five roles of Conquest form the backbone of how a match plays out and are essential to learn to a basic level since you won't always get your preferred role when you queue up for a match. Each role has its own job to fill for the team and the synergy these five roles have between each other has been carefully crafted over many years of Smite to be as efficient as possible. My personal recommendation is always to pick your two favourite roles and go as in depth as you want on those since you'll be getting them on most of your games, but put in the effort to also learn the other three roles, especially support to a basic level, so if you get put there you're not that guy saying you can't play support whenever you get it. So jumping in with the roles themselves, first up we have the mid laner who covers the central lane of the map. The job of the mid laner will be to keep this lane in check, gain farm by killing the minions located there and make rotations to nearby jungle camps or fights that erupt around the center of the map, with the occasional trip further afield to gank the two side lanes. The mid lane in smite is mostly occupied by burst mages with high damage in large aoes and solid range, but it is also fairly common to see burst damage hunters such as Ula or Amuzankab in the mid lane as well. Basically, the name of the game for mid laners is to provide huge burst damage to the team. Moving on, we'll cover the solo laner next. The job of the solo laner in conquest is to cover the lane closest to the fire giant with the blue and silver buffs on the side. I say it this way because depending on if you are order or chaos side, solo lane can be left or right lane, and that will change based on which side you're on, so don't fall into the habit of calling it by those names. It's solo lane, not right lane. The solo laner will gain farm from killing the minions and local jungle camps such as blue and silver buff, as well as the totem throughout the early game and mid game. Solo laners, much as their name might suggest, spend a large portion of the map on their own 1v1 against the enemy solo laner. Of course, ganks can happen where teammates or enemies can rotate over to your lane and vice versa if you want to make some rotations yourself, but they are generally the most isolated role for the laning phase. Solo is mostly populated by tanks and bruisers. Warriors and guardians are by far the most common classes to see here, but Solo has some of the widest variety of viable picks in the game, and a handful of gods from literally every class have seen success here over the years. 
but by far the most common are tanky warriors and guardians, so if you're new to the role, I recommend sticking to those. The final lane we have to cover is the duo lane, which, as most of you may have guessed from the name, consists of two players. The first is the ADC, or the carry. The ADC will cover the lane and farm the minions and local jungle camps there. Much like the solo laner, the ADC will often spend a large portion of the early to mid game alone, 1v1ing the enemy ADC and farming efficiently to get their all important items online. As with solo, this role is not left or right lane, but duo lane, which is closest to the gold fury and has purple and gold buff on the side. The ADC is almost always a hunter or a specific subclass of mages called magical ADCs that use basic attacks for their damage. Basically, they're hunters but they deal magical damage. Some other types of gods occasionally see play in the ADC role, but it's mostly the high single target sustained DPS that hunters and magical ADCs provide that's needed for the role for them to be the true hard carry of the team. The other player that covers the duo lane early on is the support. All the roles we've covered so far have been laners, but the support and the jungler which we'll cover in a second are roamers, not laners. In the very early game the support will play like a laner as they help their carry through the weak early game and fight in a 2v2, but after around 3-5 to five minutes the support becomes a roaming role where they will rotate wherever they're needed and usually anchor around the mid lane and split farm with the mid laner because of its central location on the map. If you're in mid, it's easier to get to anywhere you need rather than if you're on one of the side lanes, and support needs to be basically everywhere. The most popular gods for support are by far Guardians, whose tankiness and great crowd control allow them to protect the backliners, the mid and ADC, by stunning enemies as they dive onto them. Some warriors also see successful support play as well as a handful of assassins and mages, but the most common class to see in the support role is Guardians for sure. So we've covered all three lanes now, the only thing left to take care of on the map is the jungle areas, and they are of course patrolled by the final role, the jungler. Playing a very different playstyle to laning roles, the jungler doesn't get a wave of minions to gain XP and gold reliably, or split minions with their team like the support, they instead take the jungle camps found around the map to get their farm. But they're not just there to farm camps, the jungler's second main pillar is ganking. I'll cover this more in depth later on, but essentially the jungler will look to strike from out of the jungle into lanes, to kill or force out enemy players in order to get their teammates in those lanes ahead and put their opponents behind. Assassins are the most popular jungle class due to their high burst damage, especially in the early game, and high mobility that allows them to get around the jungle efficiently and gank with speed and ferocity. Though jungle has quite a wide variety of picks that can work there, and pretty much every class has a few viable junglers in it, especially warriors who, when built with some damage, can play like assassins with a bit more tankiness. But that's all the five roles of conquest, why they exist and what they do throughout the game. Let's move on to covering the jungle layout in depth. So we mentioned the jungle very briefly in the intro and the jungler section, but this area is arguably the single most important and complex area of the map. The first thing to note is that the jungle is perfectly symmetrical in the x-axis. If a jungle camp is in one place on your side, it's in the exact same relative place on the enemy side, so in reality, this whole jungle area you have to learn is only half the size. So there are three main jungle camp types on the conquest map buff camps, harpy xp camps and special camps. First up we have the buff camps, of which there are a total of 7 on the map with the new season, each of which consists of a large buff holder with two smaller side minions. Each player can only pick up one buff at a time, with some exceptions. Starting on the duo side of the map, we have the purple buff which grants attack speed and a protection reducing aura to the wielder. This goes to the ADC. Moving on over, we have the green buff which gives bonus max health and mana based on your total protections and this one goes to the support. The two buffs at the back on each side are the speed buffs and it's the only buff camp that appears twice on the map per side. This one grants bonus movement speed to the wielder. Red buff is next to mid lane and grants bonus power to the wielder and this goes to the mid laner for their high burst damage. Blue buff is on the side of solo lane and provides mana regen to the wielder and this one goes to the solo laner for their long sustained fights where they need a lot of mana to use their abilities. And finally we have the gold and silver buffs which are in a neutral location on the map. Since there is only one copy of these on the entire map, each team has to fight over this buff and they frequently become points of contention where fights can break out early on in the match. Both of these buffs can stack on top of regular buffs, so for example you can hold blue buff and silver buff at once, but you can't hold blue buff and red buff at once. Gold buff is the one on duo side and provides a health shield to the wielder, this one is usually picked up by the support but can also go to the ADC if the support isn't around since the ADC will always be close to it being in duo lane where our support will sometimes roll more and not be there to pick it up. And finally, Silver Buff is on the solo side and provides cooldown reduction. This is pretty much exclusively taken by the solo laner. So that's all the buff camps, but there are also Harpy XP camps located around the map that simply provide XP and gold with no secondary benefit. There are two Harpy camps per team, both located centrally in each side of the jungle. These are taken mostly by the jungler to get extra farm as they roam the jungle area, but can sometimes be taken by other roles if they're passing by or split with the jungler. These camps also have roaming Harpies that circle the edge of the rock where the camp is located and provide a small amount of XP and gold 
full-on kill. There are also some bonus happy camps in the area of the Oracle's and Pyromancer, which we'll talk about in a second. These happy camps only exist for the first 10 minutes of the game, after which they are replaced by the Oracle's and Pyromancer, but they provide XP and gold for those first 10 minutes and are usually taken by the jungler and or the mid laner. And finally, we have the special camps, which includes the oracles I mentioned previously, as well as the cyclops. Oracles spawn after 10 minutes next to the gold fury and provide an uncounterable area of vision on the fury after you kill them. Very useful for spotting out enemies trying to take it. And finally, the cyclops appears in different locations around the jungle in a small chest. Hit the chest to release him and slay him, after which he will give XP and gold, as well as creating an area on the ground that gives increased movement speed to allies that pass through it. Useful for getting around the jungle quickly. But that's all of the camps of the jungle. We just have one last thing to talk about in regards to the jungle area and that's the objectives of conquest which get their own section. So there are three jungle objectives in Conquest and each one gives unique benefits that are crucial to winning the match. Ignore these objectives at your peril. First up, on the duo lane side of the map we have the Gold Fury which comes in three different variants. A standard Gold Fury will always be the first spawn of the match at five minutes in and provides a solid amount of XP and large amount of gold to all five players on the team when you kill it. The Primal Fury is a variant that provides the same XP but less gold than a standard Gold Fury but also provides a permanent stacking buff that increases damage dealt and decreases damage taken from all jungle monsters and bosses for the whole team. This can stack up to three times and makes a big difference with taking future objectives. And finally, the Oni Fury again gives the same XP but less gold than a normal gold fury, but also spawns an empowered wave of minions as the next wave in each lane that will push on their own, forcing enemies to kill them off and allowing you to either start fights while they do that, or push with the empowered waves and take down enemy structures quicker. As mentioned, the first fury of the match is always the standard gold fury, but after that a random one is picked for the next spawn each time, but not the same one twice in a row. The Gold Fury overall is an extremely important objective that you should be paying attention to from 5 minutes in when it spawns. The gold and experience swing it provides can be huge in getting your team ahead, or on the flip side, falling behind if the enemy team takes it repeatedly. Not to mention the other benefits that Primal and Oni Fury can provide to the team as well. Try not to give this thing up if you can possibly avoid it. Next up we have the Pyromancer, which spawns at 10 minutes in, near the Fire Giant. It's slightly easier to kill than the Gold Fury, but not by that much and provides extra movement speed as you leave the fountain for 90 seconds, as well as the runic bomb, which can be picked up from the ground into your consumable slot and thrown. On detonation, it deals 300 physical damage plus 1000 true damage to minions and structures. That huge burst of true damage can be great for taking down towers or securing objectives like the Fire Giant and Gold Fury. And finally, the ultimate big boy of conquest, we have the Fire Giant. All these objectives will usually require multiple players to take down, but the Fire Giant will almost always be taken by a whole team. It's extremely tanky, has healing and life steal reduction built in, and will do heavy damage to the person tanking it, and often some damage to others as well. However, if you do manage to slay the Fire Giant, the buff of strong regeneration, power, and bonus damage to structures will allow your team to close out games and have a major advantage over the enemy team for letting it slip from their grasp. FG does also give gold and XP to the whole team, but at that point it's somewhat secondary to the powerful buff it provides. After 30 minutes, Fire Giant is replaced with Enhanced Fire Giant with a buff that does the same thing but much better. More regen, more power, more damage to structures, and ignores backdoor protections on structures as well. So those are the main three objectives. How do you take them? Well, each player has a general role to fill with taking objectives. The ADC with their high sustained DPS through basic attacks that don't have a cooldown will be the main source of shredding down the overall health on the objective. The mid laner with their strong ability burst damage can deal out the biggest single hits on the team and so their main job is to secure the objective and prevent a steal by dumping big damage into it all at once as it's about to die. The mid also helps with DPSing it down as well but they do less than the ADC and their main job is to secure. The solo or support will be the one tanking the objective most of the time. Both of these roles are usually very tanky and so really either one can tank the hits while the other one generally does what's called zoning, which is essentially keeping enemies away from the objective to prevent a steal and making it easier for your teammates to take it down by giving them plenty of space. And finally, the jungler can somewhat fill whatever role is needed with objectives really. They can add their damage to the mid on ADC to shred it down faster, or they can help zone with the solo and support, or they can even slink around the edges of the fight looking to pick off enemies that step out of position trying to defend. Objectives are extremely important in Conquest and the team that takes them reliably will be the team that wins 90% of the time. Don't underestimate them and don't give them up for free if at all possible. So while game phases can be simply explained as early game, roughly the first 10 minutes, mid game, roughly 10 to 20 minutes, and late game, roughly 20 minutes plus, what to actually do in each of these phases is essentially conquest in a nutshell and it is an extremely important topic. In this section I'll be covering everything you need to know about each phase and how a general match plays out in them. 
Of course, I use words like roughly because every match is different and some will transition out of the early game or into the late game faster or slower than others, but this is a good general guide. So for the first 10 minutes, the match is mostly defined by farming, lane fights and some small jungle skirmishes. The early game is extremely important since playing it poorly can lead to the game snowballing out of your control and your team going into the mid game and late game with a deficit, which can make it very hard to come back. Not to mention the average smite player tilts harder than a hippopotamus on a seesaw and so losing the early game can sometimes lead to losses that weren't really set in stone because everyone tilts and tries to F6. Farming is the key to the early game. Be it not ever missing a minion wave in your lane or taking efficient jungle pathing to clear camps as fast as possible or even invading enemy camps to get an extra lead, how you farm will define how ahead or behind you are going into the mid game where fights become a lot more common. Smite's general farming rotation consists of taking your minion wave, then a nearby jungle camp while you wait for the next wave, and repeat. Try to avoid just sitting in lane waiting for minions if you possibly can. With the introduction of the bastions, there is some incentive to remain in the lane as you can take these down for some extra gold and tower pressure, but they are often not worth focusing down in the early game, since they only give 75 gold and you can usually split a few jungle camps in that time, which is more efficient. It's worth noting as well that the way splitting farm worked in Smite is more mostly efficient with two people. If one person kills a minion or jungle monster, they get 100% of the XP. Duh. But if more than one person is sharing that XP, you only get 120% regardless. So with two people splitting, each gets 60%, with three people, 40%, 30% with four, and 24% with five. This generally leads to a meta where a maximum of two people should be splitting farm. Beyond that, each player is getting such a small percentage of the original XP that you would be better off farming something else rather than splitting. But splitting as a duo is often pretty fine and actually quite efficient. So while farming is the central focus of the early game, there will still be fighting of course. Smite is a PvP game after all and enemies will be looking to poke you out or even kill you. The difference between the early game versus later on is that the objective of most fights are to simply deny farm to the enemy. If you poke someone out so much that they can't safely stay and collect their minion wave, you win the farm game. Kills are great for sure, but with not much to do in terms of objectives and towers often being too strong to take in the early game, kills are often just a way to deny farm to enemies and get extra farm for yourself. Alright, so around the 8 to 10 minute mark in the game will be the transition to the mid game. By this point, most players should be around level 10 with about 2 items completed and fighting becomes a lot more emphasized. This is not only because there is more lethality around than in the early game, but also because major objectives start coming online and towers begin to fall in the mid game. If you win a small fight in the early game, you don't really get much more than the kill bounties and maybe an invaded buff from it, but if you win a skirmish in the mid game, you can often take a gold fury, pyromancer or perhaps even fire giant, which can massively swing the game in your favour. The fights in the mid game will also generally be larger, more rotations will be happening and teams will begin to group up more and fight around these key objectives. ADC and Solo will still remain in their lanes for a good portion of the mid game, but will start to rotate occasionally in this period, whereas they mostly stick to their lanes for the early game. This phase can often define a match as it's the most snowbally time of the game. This is why proper farming is so important in the early game. If you come into this phase on the front foot with a gold and XP lead, you can translate that into winning fights and taking key objectives in the mid game, which allows you to transition into the late game and close out the match. Don't get me wrong, farming is still important in this phase, don't give up on it entirely, but fighting becomes a lot more emphasized now that key objectives are online. The stakes are much higher. And finally, around 18 to 20 minutes we reach the late game. This is the phase where those full scale 5v5 team fights that Conquest is known for start to happen. Objectives are fully in play now and many of these fights will happen around these, especially the Fire Giant which becomes the focal point of the entire late game due to his game winning buff on taking him down. Most players should be approaching level 20 and have around 4 items at this point in the match. Farming becomes much less important because of this. XP is capped at level 20 and while gold is still important to finish off your build, you don't want to be that guy who's farming his lane at 20 minutes in while the enemy team takes fire giant in a 5v4 against your team. This is the time to group up, fight for objectives and win the game. Where farming is the key to the early game, team fighting is the key to the late game. Each role has their own duties in team fights that stem from the playstyle and god pool that sees success in each role. So a good high level overview of a conquest team fight goes as follows. The two backliners, mid and ADC, stay further back, throwing out their abilities and basic attacks from a safe range for huge damage. These two are protected by the support, who generally use their abilities to crowd control enemies, create space and keep the backline safe from the divers which are the jungle and solo. Solo generally uses their tankiness and high CC to initiate the fight onto the backline and burn some of their cooldowns with lower risk than if the jungler had to initiate because they're not as tanky. The jungler can then follow up on that initiation by diving the backliners and hopefully cleaning them up after the solo burns cooldowns and relics away from them. Every team fight is different and it's one of those things in Smite that can't really be taught as theory, it has to be experienced, but this general overview will at least tell you what your role should be doing in an ideal team fight scenario.
So next, I'm going to cover some general build rules for items. This is a new section that I'm experimenting with for this year's guide, so let me know if it's useful and I can expand it for future editions. I'll start by saying that building in Smite is extremely situational by default. Not only do high res change items like a girl changes clothes, but every match has different gods and a different flow that means you often need to adjust your build on the fly, which takes time and experience with the game. However, there are some good general rules to live by in terms of builds. Firstly, we have to look at the core stats that each role or class of gods are looking for on their items. ADCs or carries utilize their basic attacks for a majority of their damage and so are looking for attack speed, some power, lifesteal to sustain themselves and high penetration as one of their main jobs is shredding down tanks and objectives like the fire giant and towers. The mid or mage will do the opposite, dealing high burst damage with their abilities instead of basic attacks and so are looking for high power, cooldown reduction to get more abilities out faster and some penetration to get through enemies defences. Penetration is slightly less valued on mids than on ADCs but it's still very important. Supports are looking to help their teammates out wherever they can and so they enjoy the aura items that give protections to nearby teammates as well as general tankiness to stay alive so they can help out more. If you're dead, you can't stop your teammates from dying. Solo laners are looking to dive into fights, soak up damage and cause chaos for backliners. This means they need defense on health to stay alive longer and as well as often needing cooldown reduction to get their abilities out more frequently. Solo lane builds are the most situational of all though and often require specific counter building for the situation. And finally, the jungler is looking to dive in and assassinate key targets with heavy heavy burst damage, thus they need power, attack speed or cooldown reduction depending on if your god does most of their damage with basic attacks or abilities, junglers can be different with this, and penetration to shred through enemy defences as well. Depending on the god, some junglers can also make use of situational defence items. So with these general stat pulls, you should be able to pick out some good items for your role and build your base of knowledge on what's good from there. Alright, so let's finish off this guide with a few general topics that didn't really fit into any one section but are still extremely important. First up, we have ganks. This is when a player comes out of the jungle into a lane looking to push out or kill the enemy laner. Junglers do by far the most ganking, but every role can rotate from their lane to assist other teammates, especially the support who I mentioned before is a roaming role. When committing to a rotation, there's a couple of things you should think about. Firstly, what will you lose from making that rotation? Will you not be back in time for your next minion wave and miss that farm? Will you lose your tower or get your buff camp invaded as a result of that, etc. Then think about what can be gained from that rotation. Will you secure a kill on the enemy laner to put your teammate ahead? Could you then look to take a gold fury or invade an enemy buff camp using that mana advantage you now have? Etc. Then weigh those outcomes against each other and the probability of success to decide if you should rotate. Try to minimize the costs of rotating by clearing your wave first so you won't miss farm and try to maximize the rewards of rotating by timing it with objective spawns or other teammates rotations to have a mana advantage. Much like team fighting, rotations and ganks can't really be taught through theory and must be experienced, but this is my general thought process when I consider making a rotation. If you're constantly getting ganked and rotated on though, you need vision of where the enemies are as much as possible and that's where wars come in. I'm sure you've heard the phrase wards win games before and it's absolutely true. They're the unsung heroes of conquest that literally give you wall hacks. Knowing where the enemy is can be a huge advantage for spotting out ganks before they even happen, seeing objective attempts and stopping them, catching out enemies on rotations when they're alone and so far from safety that you can pick them off for a free kill, and likewise not getting picked off on your own by an ambush. All this for a measly 50 gold or 120 gold for a sentry ward that allows you to destroy enemy walls in the area, denying them these powerful effects. Here's a few good ward spots for the new year 10 map, colour coded by role. Pause the video if you want to get a closer look at these or screenshot it for future reference. Invading in Smite has become a lot less common over the years with the introduction of mechanics like the Invader's Curse, the new Unleashed camps not affecting invades, and just enemy camps being worth less if invaded in general. But it is still a thing that happens, especially after the first round of buff spawns, and so it's still worth talking about. Invades are basically worth double in Smite, since not only do you get a camp's worth of farm, the enemy loses a camp's worth. This is very different to the laning dynamic where you can't kill off your own minions to stop enemies getting farm. I mean, you sort of can by doing lane freezing or shoving the wave into the enemy's tower, but that's not really the same thing as invades that are worth double. Key invades you should be aware of are for the blue, red, green and purple buffs. Speed buff is often too far back into your own side to be invaded safely and gold and silver are neutrally placed so they aren't really an invade, everyone's already contesting those anyway. But these four buffs are in the Goldilocks zone where they're still in enemy territory but they aren't so far back that it's too risky to invade them. So definitely keep an eye out for enemies invading these and these 
you should be Yoki invade targets for you. Speed does still get invaded from time to time, but you need extensive warding and communication to do it safely because of how far back it is. On that topic, make sure to aggressively ward the enemy jungle if you're going to invade so you can see enemy movements and know if it's safe to do so. Likewise, defensively ward your own jungle and or buff camps to spot out and counter enemy invades. And finally, we have communication. In more casual modes of smite, communication is needed much less, but in conquest, it can be the difference between winning or losing a match. Whether it's simple pings and VGS commands to call enemies missing from their lane or a full-on discord call with your teammates, good calls and communication can win games as much as individual player skill can. This goes hand in hand with warding since the information on enemy positions that wards provide is essentially a free way to communicate enemy movements to your team. Be sure to learn key VGS commands if you don't know them already such as enemy missing, attack and defend for lanes and objectives, enemies incoming, gank, etc. And use them to frequently call out enemy intentions, your own intentions and positioning. But that's everything you need to know about Conquest for Year 10 Smite. A lot went into making this year's guide the best ever so if you stayed around until the end you probably enjoyed and found it useful so don't forget to drop a like before you leave and i'll catch you guys in another one later on have a great day and peace out you nerds